the next talk that we have uh, that we have and I, I guess how to discuss how the discount per presentation you know it was ironic because when I when we were reading the CFPs we were looking at the CFP and I was looking at the description and it was really eerily familiar it sounded really really familiar because uh, does anyone remember the uh, not too long ago uh, there was a, a DDoS, a distributed, a distributed analysis service attack against Dyn, and it took down some of the big websites uh, back in October of 2016. It also affected all of each and every one of my courses as well. I write, coincidentally, two weeks before all that mess happened in October of 2016, which took out some of the biggest, ser web biggest services on the internet. I was uh, I was putting together uh, content and material to talk about distributed uh, distributed analysis service attacks, and uh, I was looking. One of my resources that I that, that was just absolutely fantastic was on IP spoofing by by Merrick uh, is it Bajowski? And sure enough, when we opened uh, when when we when we read the abstract, with of course the name and the title were the the name and the title were. Were, were, were covered. Once I opened it up, as it was so spooky, it was like sure enough, here it is. So now it's very coincidental, and I, I guess things happen for a reason, Mer uh, uh, Merrick. I think things happen for a reason, and that's why we're here, ladies and gentlemen from Cloud Firm, Merrick McGowski. No one said my surname is easy. Um, all right, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, first thing, this, this, the room is fairly packed, so if you have a free seat near you, can you raise your hand so people at the back, if they want to sit, they would know that there are a couple of seats in front, especially left. Uh, so yeah, please do grab a seat. This is going to be a long talk. <laughs> yep, there are still seats in front. And also, at the back is super cold, so it's much warmer here. <laughs> <You're not helping>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me get started. So uh, this is talk uh, about IP spoofing, and I dare you, I will say the phrase IP spoofing at least 100 times. So if you are not in technology, you can at least count if, I'm, if I'll, I'll do that. Uh, and I promise that I will not say cyber any time. So it's not about cyber, it's about IP spoofing. Um, if, you, if you look at this talk kind of from the higher level point of view, you can sum it up as how the internet works, uh, what's broken in the internet fundamentally, and how we as the internet community can fix it eventually. Uh, that's the optimistic view. Uh, but more, more specifically, this talk is going to be about IP spoofing, what it is, uh, how it allows the largest attacks, and finally, how to fix it, so with a positive note at the end. All right, so what is IP spoofing? I'm sure everyone here in this room knows this is, this is Packet Hacking Village, but still, let's, let's, let's give a couple of slides uh, of introduction what I'm going to talk about. So by IP spoofing in this talk, I mean the uh, capability of our network cards, of our, of our devices, internet devices, of transmitting packets over the internet. And on our phone, on our uh, laptop, everywhere, on every connected device, uh, the network card itself doesn't know anything about the higher level protocols. So from the hardware point of view, you can transmit whatever the hell you want over the network. And we offer for, often forget about it. You know, people program in JavaScript these days and whatever, Python, and they forget that network card inherently is, is a device that we control. So you can basically transmit whatever you want uh, over the network, and that includes uh, the headers, all the headers. That includes the IP header. So once again, fundamentally, you can put whatever data you need, you want in the IP header. And by IP spoofing in this talk, I mean specifically putting the uh, fake or, or malicious IP address in the source IP port on the IP packet. So basically overriding the, the source IP in the packets. And you can totally do that. Uh, this is absolutely legitimate feature of our network stack. So what's the problem? Why this is bad? Why this is something uh, we have to talk about? 
It's bad because it fundamentally enables imper impersonation. So from the receiving uh, host point of view, if you ever receive any packet from the internet, basically there is no way you can find out if the packet was actually originated in the source IP it, it says, or was it actually fake and, deliver and, and created by someone else, some potentially mal malicious actor. Basically there is no way from the receiving side to know that. And that's pretty bad. And we learned that it's pretty bad years ago. Um, this is a photo of Kevin Mitnick, uh, who, is, who used to be, or still is, one of the, the most famous, the famous hackers in, in the universe, in the galaxy. Um, so one of the, his, his uh, best attacks was against uh, Mr. Shimomura, and in 1995 he basically took over Shimomura's TCP session and injected some, uh, some commands in his TCP session, therefore granting himself fruit. And he was able to do that only because he was able to spoof packets. It is because he was able to fake the packets, put magical commands there, and grant himself access. And that was in 1995, so quite a while ago. Since then, IP spoofing uh, was a problem, and number and number and number of different attacks, different exploits, um, different kind of inter fundamentally internet uh, issues. Uh, in 1996, we had a wave of sin floods, uh, which I would say kind of the problem of SimFlight was solved only about two or three years ago, uh, but SimFlighting is a different story. Um, in 1998, we have my favorite uh, attack, uh, sorry, scanning technique called idle scanning. Uh, this was invented by Antires, who now is working on Redis. But if you haven't read, uh, if you don't know what idle scanning is, I highly recommend it. It's a super interesting scanning technique, again, based on requiring IP spoofing. Then we had a whole bunch of problems with TCP implementations. I think the most well-known are the ones when a malicious attacker, by forging reset packet, was able to drop BGP uh, connections. So that, could, that, could, that, that, that led to pretty serious problems in the internet. And then there was another you know, 10 years, and in 2008, uh, we all know the famous Dan Kamenski's uh, DNS bug, uh, DNS issues, which again were only triggered, could only be triggered if you could do IP spoofing. And I would say since about 2013, we have a new wave of attacks, uh, of the big denial of service attacks, which again are all caused by IP spoofing. But you know, that's, that was on the attacking side. What's on the defense side? Are we making any progress as the internet community? Is, is, there, is there anything happening? Of course. Uh, the first formal definition that you know, IP spoofing is something, but uh, it, it was around 1998. Um, around 2000, there was a, B a famous BCP38 um, published it basically says, yep, the internet works as it works, but we should not allow uh, end hosts to forge packets, to send packets from the IPs. They don't belong, don't belong, don't, don't belong to them. Uh, unfortunately, BCP38 is fairly naive. Uh, so then BCP84, four years later, came in and said, you know, it's harder than we thought, but still we should do that. Um, and there are many working groups and many kind of initiatives that, that right now try to uh, fight IP spoofing. So they, there is the EATF working group called Savvy. There is MANRS uh, working group um, in the industry. And then there is the spoofer.kai.org project, which tries to track down the IP spoofing around the world. So this is a chart from the spoofer.kaida uh, project. And it basically shows that uh, around 56% of ASs of networks on the internet do not allow spoofing, so it's good. Not everyone allows spoofing, but still, the whole problem is not solved yet. Uh, there is around 27% of ASs of networks that do allow IP spoofing. So, you know, the problem still exists in the internet, even though it was first uh, problematic in 1995. And not only that, uh, there is the whole industry around amplification and around attacks using IP spoofing. So if you, if you use your Google skills properly, you'll be able to find services like this one. So spoofing enabled offshore servers when you can, uh, for Bitcoin, buy bandwidth, not even bandwidth, buy, buy servers and do whatever spoofing you want. Uh, so this is a problem. This is a proper industry. This is a problem. By the way, in the terms of service, they do tell you that if their ISP disables spoofing, if their ISP tries to uh, enforce filtering, they will not give you the Bitcoins back. All right, so what's, uh, what's the big deal about spoofing? Well, in my opinion, it enables the large attacks. So if you open news outlets and read about the big, I don't know, ransom, uh, ransom emails uh, requiring, I don't know, banks to pay up or kind of attacks that actually were influencing some institutions, in most cases, not all, but most cases, those big attacks, the biggest attacks, will be caused by IP spoofing in one way or another. 
Now, there is there needs to be a disclaimer here. I'm not. This is not about the Mirai attacks. So like, we can speak about the Mirai and Dyn uh, at the end in the question section because they were a bit different. But except for the, the, this case, the major attacks you, you've heard were almost all about IP spoofing. All right, so who am I? Why do I care? Uh, why, do, how, why do I know anything about it? Um, so I work at Cloudflare, and we operate a global reverse proxy network. Uh, we have our servers all around the globe. Uh, we operate on almost all continents. We have customers from all backgrounds, from government agencies to social, uh, social uh, portals. So, and, and we also have plenty of customers. So we see a, quite a good uh, uh, cross-section of what's happening on the internet. This is a chart of daily attacks that we categorize as denial of service attacks. Uh, uh, this is uh, per day. And you can see that some days are quite quiet with uh, 50 or, or 60 uh, events that we categorize as denial of service attacks. And some of them are more busy with up to 1,400 events. So we, we see a good chunk of the weird things on the internet. And uh, I won't lie, most of the attacks that we see are fairly small. They are not really uh, anything exciting. But some of the attacks that we do see are super large, are gigantic. And over the years, we've published a number of, uh, of blog posts uh, describing those attacks in, in big details. Um, and, and in this talk, I'm going to show you two major types of attacks we've seen. And I'm going to also emphasize why they are uh, problematic because of the IP spoofing. All right. So one of the attacks I'm going to talk about is called, I will call direct attack, and the other one it will be amplification. So let's start with the, the direct attack. Um, so what is it? Uh, why, do I, why do I put it in a separate category? Um, so this is an attack when the attacker is just transmitting packets directly to us, directly to the target, uh, without any amplification, any reflection in the middle. It's just packets from the source, the target, that's it. Fairly simple. But we cannot really trace the attacker because the source IPs of the attack are spoofed, so we don't know who actually originated them. Uh, about a year ago, we published a story which we dubbed the winter of attacks, uh, in which case the attacker had about 400 gigs of uh, capacity, uh, of spoofing capacity. These are the charts that we published. Uh, they look fairly, uh, fairly shady, but basically we, we were hit with about uh, 200, with, on the peak, 200 million packets per second of the attack traffic, and in the peak as well, about 400 gigabits per second of the attack traffic. So it was, it was fairly substantial. And once again, it was a direct attack. So there exists an attacker in the world at least a year ago uh, that had 400 gigabits of spoofing capacity. Um, so the interesting things about this type of attack is that they, are, they usually originate in only a couple places, in a couple of, I would say, big data centers or in, on, on big ISPs. So when we see them, um, we see them only in a couple of places around the world. Uh, so that, that's, how we, that's how we notice. Okay, so when, once we see such an attack, what do we do? Well, we first, we have to make sure that we are kept online, that our servers are operating, that our customers do not feel the problem, that, you know, we are, that you know, the internet still works for majority of our customers, for all of our customers. So what do we do? Well, we obviously try to figure out what is hitting us. So we run TCP dump or some other tools and try to figure out what is in the packets. And in this case, those 400 gigs, this, this was a SIN flood. So it was a very, very, very large SIN flood. And it's interesting because uh, it had to be, SYN floods have to be direct. There's no way to reflect SYN floods. So basically, if you see a SYN flood, this is direct attacks. In many of the SYN floods, the uh, IP packets, the IP, sor IP sources are not spoofed. So the, it ju it's just flood of SYN packets with a source IP addresses belonging to the attacker. But in that case, it's easy to recognize who's attacking you. In our situation, the source IPs were obfuscated. They were just random numbers. Okay, so how do we keep ourselves online when we see 400 gigs of SYN floods? Well, we mitigate it. And our favorite mitigation technique is called BPF. This is an example of IP tables command with BPFs inside. So what is a BPF? BPF is a bytecode. It's a, uh, a program that you can stick inside your firewall, inside your IP firewall, and run it within IP tables. In this bytecode, you can read data from the packet, and you can, you can basically have an almost fully-fledged program running inside your firewall, which is super cool. So on this, um, on this uh, uh, command line prompt, you can see a byte of num bunch of numbers. What, the, what are those numbers? As I mentioned, they are a program. Here is the same program. It's just decompiled to more assembly-like format. So once again, it's almost fully-fledged program. And 
By the way, if you ever run a TCP dump or Wireshark, you should be familiar with BPFs because that's exactly the interface between TCP dump and the kernel. So if you use TCP dump and type something like port 80, this will be compiled down to this bytecode. Um, all right, so more specifically, we cannot really use the TCP dump expressions because they are a bit too limited. So we wrote a series of tools that we actually use to mitigate the big attacks. Uh, they're all open source, so on our GitHub you can find BPF tools, and that's exactly the bytecodes that we run to, to mitigate uh, attacks, and in, including synflats. Um, now, there, there needs to be a disclaimer here. Although IP tables is fast and BPFs are super fast and works, it, will, it all works reasonably well, uh, there are still some limitations. Um, IP tables run fairly late in the kernel uh, network stack. Um, so you can do much, much faster by doing some magical tricks like kernel bypass. But I won't go there uh, because there's a new development in kernel, in Linux kernel called XDP, uh, which is Express Data Path. It's available from kernel 4.9. And you need, right now you need to have a magical a specific network cards. Only a couple of vendors support it. But it's super cool. It's, it's, it's really great. Uh, but that's it. I won't say much because uh, tomorrow, 2 p.m., my colleague will give a talk exactly about XDP. So stay tuned and, and be here tomorrow at 2 p.m. All right, so we mentioned how we uh, keep our services online, how we drop the SIM packets on the floor. Um, and sometimes we want to identify who's actually behind those attacks. We want to dig deeper into you know, who, who is actually sending the tra traffic, where the traffic originates. Um, so basically we need to ad identify, since the source IPs are spoofed, we need to identify from which physical cable the packets were delivered, like where, where they are coming from. Um, we have no number of, uh, number of cables connected to our routers. Um, so what we do is we, we log into our routers and we chase the graphs. Um, this is a chart, this is a couple of charts from our, one of our routers, and here you, can, you should be able to clearly see that there are some inbound spikes uh, hitting whatever 10 gigs. Um, on the inbound, on the, on the kind of bottom left chart. So it's easy identif to be identify you know, from which interface, from which physical cable that ca is coming from, even though the source IPs are obfuscated. All right, so then we follow the wires, then we uh, look on our rou router carefully, and we try to figure out who's on the other side of the cable, who's actually sending us the traffic. And there are generally three types of cables that our routers have, three types of connectivity that we have on our routers. This is basically how the internet works, by the way. Um, so the first type of cabling is uh, called PNIs, direct peering, or cross connects. It's basically a direct connection, a direct cable uh, laid from our router to someone else's router uh, when this someone else is an entity similar to, to our company. So it could be uh, Google, it could be Akamai, it could be uh, AWS, it could be uh, any other number of providers. Um, so basically an, another, another entity on the internet. The second type of cabling that we, we have is a cable that goes from our router to local internet exchanges. Um, I will speak more about local internet exchanges, but basically internet exchanges are a, a, a collaboration of local ISPs, uh, and it's a single place where they all connect. And finally, there is the connectivity to the uh, transit providers or internet carriers, where basically this is paid for traffic. We paid for, uh, pay, pay for to deliver packets to the internet. So it's kind of normal connectivity to the internet. All right, so let's imagine that the attack came from direct peering. So what do we do in this case? What do we do if we know that you know, the attack packets came from this specific cable, which has this another entity on the other side? So it's easy. It's easy because we can just uh, call up them and say, you know, guys, you're delivering us junk. Uh, please don't, don't attack us. Please don't do that. And the good news is that this usually works. This usually works well. So the... Um, the relationship between us and other parts that we cross-connect to is usually very friendly. It's in both our interests to, you know, to keep the relationship okay. Um, we do have sometimes situations when the, uh, the ISP on the other side does respond to our calls and say, okay, I'll, I will kick off the customer that's actually attacking you. And then the problem reappears a couple of days or weeks later. But this is fine. Like, we can call them again. Uh, and in the worst case, we can just depeer them and force the attack traffic to go over the internet and increase their costs. So, so basically, there is some discussion here. So that's great. So what about the other two uh, options? What, what if the attack comes over the internet exchange? Or what if the spoofed attack comes over uh, internet carrier and, and transit providers? Unfortunately, in these cases, we cannot do much. So this is a pretty sad story here. Um, so let me explain to you why this is the case. Um, okay, so let's, let's focus on internet exchanges for a while. 
So this is a picture of, uh, I think, Seattle Internet Exchange. It's basically a gigantic layer to switch uh, with plenty of cables uh, uh, in, with local internet providers connected. Um, so what's the issue? The issue is that uh, internet exchanges are layer two switches, so they are ethernet switches, uh, while, while routers are layer three beasts, are layer three entities. Um, and from router point of view, router is there to route packets, so it takes packets, it throws away the ethernet frame as quickly as it can. That's its sole job, it's to route packets on the IP layer. And then it routes it back to our data centers. And that's an issue, because from the router point of view, all that router knows is that, yep, there are packets, they, they are DAC packets, they are coming from Internet Exchange, that's all I know, I don't, don't know anything else. So basically, we cannot really uh, figure out which of the local ISPs, which of the local connected parties is actually originating the traffic. Now, if you think about it, this data is there because it is in the Ethernet frame and the source MAC address usually uh, should point out to the, to, the, to the router that is belonging to the entity that is sending the junk traffic. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, router doesn't, our router doesn't really look at that uh, because it's on a different layer. So this is pretty sad. Okay, so what's in the, um, in the third case? Uh, when, uh, what happens in if the attack comes over internet carriers uh, or transit providers? What can we do in such a case? Well, we often call them up and say, you know, guys, you are delivering us packets uh, which, which are just junk, which are just invalid packets. Um, and uh, they say, well, it's because you paid us to do that. And that's true, like, the internet carriers are there to deliver packets. We paid them exactly for this job. And by the way, I don't think that is their, is their, is their job to filter the packets. It's censorship is not really their job. So it's kind of fine, but still, they should be able to do something about it. They should be able to inspect their network and figure out which of their customers is actually originating the traffic. Unfortunately, that's not the case. They can't really do that. So again, pretty sad story. We see packets flying in from our internet carrier. We have no idea who is actually originating them. So that's, that all leads to the conclusion that basically, in most cases, tracing back these spoofed packets is impossible. And that's, that's pretty bad. And that's pretty bad because we cannot really push back against it. We cannot really figure out who, you know, which, which data centers are evil, which ISPs are evil, because we just don't know. Okay, so let's deep and dig into a bit more details um, into the attacks I showed, which is the winter of attacks, which I mentioned already. I can actually share a couple of more details about this specific attack. Um, so this attack was on the third category. This attack, uh, this 400 gigs, was coming to us over, over paid for internet carrier. Um, and in this specific attack, the source IP address were belonging to an, to, uh, an AS number belonging to Hurricane Electric. Hurricane Electric is a big, um, a big internet carrier. Uh, they are one of the more competent ones. But anyway, what, from what we know, all we know, knew is that we see attack traffic, we see SIN flood, and the SIN flood comes from IP ranges belonging to Hurricane Electric. Okay, that's pretty bad. But then we noticed that actually the attack was coming to our Los Angeles data center, and Los in Los Angeles we actually have a direct connectivity to Hurricane Electric. So that leads to two conclusions, to, to, to two options. One option is that, okay, the attack was actually com coming from Hurricane Electric, you know, it is possible, uh, but in that case, it should be delivered over direct link with us. It shouldn't be delivered over paid for internet. So maybe they misconfigured the routing. If, if so, they should fire their uh, router admins because they just paid for a big attack traffic. Uh, so, that's, so let's say that's not the case. So the other interpretation is, of course, that our internet carrier has a client, has a customer who is spoofing packets and pretending to be Hurricane Electric. But this is a nice situation, uh, a nice explanation that our internet carrier actually doesn't know, does not know if the packets are valid or not. From the internet carrier's point of view, these packets are originating in Hurricane, Elec Hurricane Electric, and that can be okay, that can be fine. It's, it's just we know that, that that wasn't the case in this situation. All right, let me show you a couple of more examples um, of similar attacks. Uh, but before I show you more details, we need to draw, uh, we need to have vocabulary to speak, speak about those attacks, uh, those IP spoofing attacks. Um, so this is, uh, this is how we are going to show it. Um, so this is a, in a picture from XKCD um, by Randall Monroe from about 10 years old, and he attempted to draw a map of the internet. Uh, it's not easy. Um, so what he did is he used a, thing, a mathematical thing called a Hilbert curve. And the Hilbert curve is a way to draw a line over two-dimensional space that will kind of group things together. So in each of the squares you can see here, there is a slash eight subnet. 
Um, so you can see top right corner, there are some reserved blocks. Uh, again, kind of top right corner, there's a multi multicast groups. So basically, all the slash eights are kind of close together in a, in, a, uh, in a square. If you look at slash 16s, they will also be in a smaller square and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty cool way of visualizing IP space, basically. Okay, so let me show you one of the attacks. So this is, this is a Hilbert curve drawn by me. You can see some hashed out blocks. These blocks are basically unroutable IP addresses. Uh, and in the middle, there is uh, 127 slash 8, so kind of reserved uh, loopback uh, ra IP range. Okay, so in this attack, for each of the source IPs that we saw, uh, there was, uh, I drew uh, the black dot. Okay, so plenty of IP addresses scattered all around. Is that interesting? Was it spoofed? What's, what's, what's exciting about this? Well, not much until you realize that this is uh, these are IP ranges belonging to uh, China Telecom. So again, this is the attack, this is China Telecom. Attack, China Telecom. So the interpretation of this is fairly hard. Like I'm not saying China Telecom attacked us, I'm saying the IP addresses belonging to China Telecom were used in, atta in the attack. And from my point of view, it's super hard to actually figure out what's happening behind the scenes. So there are two interpretations possible. One interpretation is that someone has a large botnet in China. I know it is totally possible that someone has a gigantic button in China is just using it to attack us. That's, that's, that's fairly sane, it's possible. In such case, the IP addresses will not be spoofed. They will be properly legitimate IP addresses belonging to, to malicious bots uh, in China. On the other hand, if you look at that again, they seem to be quite well distributed. Again, I'm not an expert. Maybe China Telecom IP addresses are distributed evenly around the China population. I don't know if that's the case, not possible. But it could also be the case that someone is just, just went through the uh, IP allocations and is just spoofing the China Telecom IP addresses. Uh, there is no way to, find, to figure it out. Okay, so another example of exciting attack. Um, this one, this is, this is my, my favorite. Um, so in this case, you can see that the source IPs are just uniformly distributed across the whole IP space, including the reserved blocks, including 255, uh, so the, the top one, including zero, so the bottom one, but also including reserved blocks like 127 slash eight. So if you attack me, ask me, do I see attacks from loopback? Yes, absolutely. Every second of the day, I see malicious packets com company, coming from 127.01 attacking my network. Uh, so you know, there is that. Uh, there are then variations on, on top of that. So for example, this is a very similar chart with uniformly distributed sort IP addresses across the whole IP space. Uh, but with, with the reserved blocks uh, uh, skip, skipped. Um, now, the question is, why did it happen? W was it uh, the attacker that is smart? And you know, when, th when they have the routine that is forging the source IP addresses, is the attacker just you know, filtering the IP addresses and say, OK, there is zero, so maybe let's not put the obviously wrong ones? But I don't think that's the case. So I think what's actually happening is that their ISP is filtering the traffic. Uh, but again, there is no way for me to figure it out. Um, there is next one, next very uni uniform distribution. Why this particular pattern? I have no idea. Maybe someone will know. Um, and another one, um, this may again look like a fairly uh, nice uh, either gigantic botnet from all around the world or, uh, or just someone spoofing some weird stuff and with, with a bit more density and, and kind of the lower IP ranges. But no, if you look at this particular chart uh, carefully, you would notice if, if you're a network expert, you will notice that those dots correspond exactly to the non-routable IP ranges. So in current internet, almost every ad IP address belongs to someone these days, but there are still plenty of IP blocks that are not routable, that don't exist in the global BGP routing table. So in this case, the attacker was fairly sophisticated. The attacker went through the global BGP routing table, inverted it, so figured out, okay, so what blocks are not present there, and only spoofed these. Why such? I don't know, but here you are. All right, so that's all I have on the direct attacks. When I actually can see the source IP addresses, I can actually argue about it. Again, I cannot really track it back to anyone, but at least I, I see them. But then there is a second category of attacks called the amplification attacks. Um, so about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we published a story um, about SSDP amplification. Uh, these charts are not, so, not as, as exciting, but basically they show that the attack we received to our network uh, was of about 40 million packets per second, um, and the volume was about 110 gigabits per second. So you know, 
a sizable, a sizable attack. Okay, so what is an amplification attack? Uh, just a couple of slides on it. The general idea is that um, there exist uh, UDP servers in the world, UDP protocols in the world, uh, with a basic request response uh, protocols. And the idea of those protocols is that the client creates a request and the server responds, that's it. And you know that because every day you use DNS and it works exactly like that. You know that because NTP works exactly like that and a number, number of other protocols work in the same fashion. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that if you can spoof packets, you can forge the request. So you can convince a legitimate server to answer to a request that wasn't really asked in the first place. And therefore you can cause uh, the server, legitimate server, to trigger a legitimate answer to, to a target. Um, and that way you can basically uh, uh, amplify the attack. So the main idea is that in many of those protocols, the responses are much, much, much larger than the requests. For example, in DNS. In DNS, the request is usually small, and the response is usually much larger. And if that's the case, if, if this is the case in the UDP uh, protocol you're using, you can create an amplification of a big, big size. So in this case, it, it's like 10 times, uh, but it's not uncommon to see 20 times or 80 times amplifications. And this is great from the attacker point of view because you know, possessing one gigabit per second of uh, attack uh, of spoofing capacity, you are able to generate much, much, much larger uh, attack volume uh, uh, going to the target. Um, also, also, you never use a single UDP server. You have to scale it out. There is no single UDP server that can generate too much traffic. Um, so that, that's what we saw those couples of weeks ago. Um, so what we saw was an attack uh, which, which, again, on our side had about 112 gigabits per second. Um, there, was, there were about 490,000 uh, reflectors used, so you know, a sizable chunk, a, a big number of reflectors. Um, and we believe that the attacker only had about 5 gigs of spoofing capacity. That's what we can know from, from the kind of the looking at the protocol deeper. Um, all right, so again, what do we do in case of such an attack? Well, the first thing, as always, is we try to keep ourselves online. Um, so how do we do that? There are a number of techniques we're using, uh, but once one, one that the most interesting one is uh, that we are, uh, we are, this attack is nicely distributed geographically. This is because all of those reflectors, all those 940,000 reflectors around the world, they don't belong in a single place in the world. They are, they are scattered all around the globe. And this is, this is good from our point of view because the, tra the attack traffic is nicely delivered to all our data centers. We can do that because um, we run an Anycast network. So we advertise the same IP ranges all over the world. Uh, therefore, the attack packets will be delivered to the closest data center, uh, that is to the, to the reflector servers. So again, uh, our architecture allows us to, to basically split the traffic very evenly across our data centers. Okay, so what do we do next? Well, blocking these attacks is usually very, very simple. Uh, these attacks usually happen, usually come from a, from a s specific protocol. Uh, so if it's SSDP, uh, you know, the servers will always send packets from port 1900. So you're ju just dropping port 1900 with the protocol UDP on your firewall will do the job. So there it, it's, it's really fairly simple. It's a bit harder for things like DNS because you can't really drop all DNS traffic, but still, fundamentally, that's, that's like fairly simple thing. Okay, and how do we identify the sources? Who, how do we know who actually is attacking us? And the answer is that we don't, and we cannot do that, and no one can do that. And that's pretty sad, again. So the issue is that the packets that, that are delivered to us are legitimate. The reflector servers deliver us responses to the requests we never asked in the first place. But still, the packets were legitimate. The source IPs are absolutely correct. Um, so if you wanted to trace it back, we would need to ask the internet, dear internet, who in the internet forged our source IP addresses? And there is just no, you just can't ask this question. All right, so what about the amplifications? Um, so in the in other blog post that he published, we mentioned a couple of other protocols used. Uh, but these are usually the usual suspects. Um, so it's usually NTP, it's SSDP is the biggest one we saw. Uh, there's also DNS uh, and a couple of other protocols. Um, and most interestingly, there are a couple of gaming protocols. So, uh, so I think we will see a, a, a new interesting attacks uh, you, that are using gaming protocols, like Call of Duty or, or Source, um, because, because these protocols are not audited well enough. Um, on the attack sizes, the amplification attacks are usually fairly small. So the average size of the attacks we noticed in the last six months was about seven gigabit, gigabytes, gigabits per second. 
Um, so, you know, not gigantic, sizable for small internet players, but, you know, not gigantic. Um, the maximum was 100 gigs, as, as I mentioned, so this is a bit outdated. Um, but still, it's, it's not uncommon to see uh, DNS attacks, uh, DNS reflection attacks, going up to four, 44 gigabits per second, or NTP attacks, I think the maximum NTP one we saw was uh, 64 gigabits, recent, just, just over the last six months. Um, all right. Um, that's, that's, that's almost it. Um, so basically, there are kind of three themes in this talk so far. One is that IP spoofing is generally bad, and it allows all kinds of problems, and most, most importantly, the big attacks. The second thing is that in order to survive the big attacks, you need to have big network capacity, and that's pretty unfortunate, because that means that only big internet players can survive the largest attacks. And also, the third one is that fighting against those attacks is basically impossible. There is no way to trace the attacker. There is no way to put pressure on the attacker. We just don't know who is on the other side of the wire. Okay, so how the internet can fix it, how we can influence uh, you know, our colleagues, uh, how we can buy bandwidth, how we can, what, what, what can we do as internet community to fix it eventually? Okay, so let's tackle it uh, step by step. Um, so first, we have, to, we have to understand that these attacks are possible only because of IP spoofing. Uh, we would not speak here about amplifications if it wasn't about IP spoofing. I wouldn't speak about SYN floods if it wasn't about IP spoofing. Yes, SYN floods would have existed, but I would be able to just sue or put pressure on the people that are actually sending me the malicious traffic. Um, so what can we do about IP spoofing? Well, fundamentally, we cannot really do much uh, because that's how the internet works. But we should continue the usual efforts. We should continue promoting BCP38 uh, and basically promote good network practices. Um, these, these things are not dead. They, they just, we, we just need to spend more time on it. But we can do even more things. Uh, there is this spoofercaida.org project, which I mentioned already. Um, they, they, uh, they give you, an, if, if you want, you can download an application which will run in the background and will basically test networks that you connect to for IP spoofing. So this is pretty cool. So you can basically, as you go around the world, you can basically see what networks are, allow spoofing to what degree. And finally, uh, we vendors can do a lot. Um, for example, right now the uh, RPF, so uh, re uh, reverse path filtering, sorry, forwarding, is not enabled by default if you buy a new router. It should be enabled by default. Um, there are reasons why you might want to disable it, but still, by, by default, for most of the users, it should be enabled. Um, but, but again, we have to appreciate that actually doing filtering is hard. Filtering must be done close to the source, uh, so it's basically the anti-ISPs responsibility. And you know, many ISPs, as I, as I showed, 56% of the ISPs already fixed their networks, but there are still plenty of ISPs around the world which just either don't know that this is a problem or don't care. Um, so we will be left for next years with the incompetent uh, ISPs. So we will be left with the problem. So we need to figure out other strategies as well as we go. Okay, so the second, the second th thing is network capacity. What can we do to avoid everyone to have gigantic pipes in order to intake the, uh, the amplification attacks, for example? And here I believe we have a technological, technical uh, solution, which is called BGP flow spec. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of BGP flow spec. BGP flow, flow spec is basically a protocol created on top of BGP, uh, which al allows you to serve firewall rules up uh, the routing uh, chain. So basically, your router over a BGP session can tell to our routers, by the way, here are my firewall rules. I don't want some of the traffic. I don't want the SSDP traffic. I want the amplification traffic. Drop it, drop it as close as possible. And this is great because this allows you to relieve the congestion on the last link and basically push firewall rules up the chain. Uh, now, truth be told, uh, we did have a couple of issues with, with Flowspec uh, early on. So a couple of years ago, we had a number of outages caused by that. I mean, so, sorry, Flowspec worked perfectly. It dropped all the attack traffic. Um, <laughs> 100% of that tra 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 attack traffic. Unfortunately, it also dropped. We also had we also dropped normal traffic. But these are technical problems, uh, and I think I'm, I'm sure they are fixable. And I'm sure they are all fixed already. This particular outage was caused by us putting IPv6 uh, IP addresses in flow spec rules, which was not supported at the time. And once again, the flow spec uh, shines because it can cross AES boundaries. You c it, it can. It's a firewall rule language which can basically cross ASs. So that's, again, great. You can basically uh, move your rules up the chain. Now, 
again, I won't lie, most people that use FlowSpec use it within one domain, within their AS number. It doesn't cross the boundary. Um, so it's not as useful, but I think it, is, it should be deployed uh, kind of as, 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 as the cross-AS cross thing. And then, there, and, then, and there is at least one success story uh, in Russia. So Rascom, I think a year ago, created uh, a service which basically enables their customers to send FlowSpec, FlowSpec firewall rules, up the chain. So there is ex at least one internet carrier that does this thing right. So it is possible. So next time you, you choose your, your, your bandwidth you, uh, vendor, uh, you choose who to buy the bandwidth from, ask about FlowSpec. Okay, and finally, what about tracing bug? Can we ever find out who is behind the at attacks? Um, can, we, can we know that? The answer is yes, and again, there is a technical solution, which is called NetFlow, or now this is called IPFix. IP and again, I'm a super fan of NetFlow. So what is NetFlow? NetFlow is a protocol which allows the routers uh, to send packet samples, actually not packet, but flow samples, to a central location, but this time within one, day, one AS number, within your uh, domain, so it doesn't cross, so there's kind of no privacy issues to cross data across uh, ASs. Um, and this data can be collected and can be analyzed. And with this data, if configured properly with good tool chain, ISPs and inter internet carriers and tier one providers should be able to answer questions like, which of your, which of your uh, customers actually originated the, 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 the shitty traffic? Who is actually behind it? Who, who is actually being paid money to deliver the, um, the, the spoofed traffic? So yeah, so we could just call them in such a case and ask, and they will just run a simple command line tool uh, and basically be able to answer those questions. But once again, the point is right now it's impossible. Uh, the ISPs generally do not, do not support flow spec, and that's pretty bad. Um, there is the privacy aspect of that. So people say that, okay, using NetFlow and basically logging traffic on disk ISPs is bad um, for, for the privacy. Uh, this is true. Uh, I'm, I'm basically asking for more logging. But there are ways around it. There are ways to, to find a compromise. So for example, I'm only interested in the really, really, really big, big, big attacks. I'm only interested in the gi gigantic spikes which, which threaten the stability of the internet. I really don't care about your customer connections. So you can set the sampling rate to the lowest or largest, depending how you look at that, put mas maximum value. So which is one, I think, in 64,000 of flows. So unless you are sending 64,000 of flows a second, your privacy should be reasonably uh, preserved. And second thing is I care only about recent attacks. I care only about last, whatever, 48 hours of traffic. So the logs can be uh, aggressively ro rotated. This is fine. Okay, so there is a tangent that it is a bit harder for the internet exchanges. Uh, but again, there are technical solutions to that. One of the solutions is called Mac accounting, which is a feature in, uh, in our routers which allows us to do something and get more statistics about the MAC addresses on that network. And the second thing is, um, is that internet exchanges, so this kind of no man's land between ISPs, should play more active role in, in guarding the internet. Internet exchanges should, um, should, have, should provide tools to figure out where the attacks are originated. All right, uh, that's it. So a quick recap is, in order to prevent the IP spoofing, we have to promote BCP38. This is the root of the actual problem. But unfortunately, it will not fix it in short time. Uh, in the meantime, we should definitely promote FlowSpec uh, because this allows smaller players to avoid buying gigantic, gigantic network capacity. So basically, this will uh, enable smaller players to survive big attacks. Uh, and finally, NetFlow is necessary, is required uh, to figure out who's behind the attacks, to trace them back, and basically solve the problem uh, uh, by just putting pressure on the attacking parties. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it. That's all I have. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm lying. I have 30 more slides uh, with more technical details. But I think we should stop here. Thank you, Miguel. Anyone have any question? Please. Anyone? I, I, I have a t-shirt to give away. <laughs> Against what? Can you, can you just stand up?
So, so is it ever worth it to call up, you know, ISPs and like chain? Okay, so this ISP, you know, whatever transit partner you're getting it from, they don't know where it's coming from, but they know which of their transit partners it's from. And you know, you go ask mom, and then you ask dad, and then you ask cousin, and eventually find the end. Is it ever worth trying to chase that, despite how difficult it is? So the question is: Is it ever worth kind of? Um, asking your ISP and, and following the chain? The answer is we do that, we do that eventually, but the issue is they just don't know. Our providers, our tier ones say, yep, the packets are coming from someone and so... And we just don't have the logs. We just have no idea, we have no visibility in our network because I don't know. Uh, so there, there is a tangent here, which is the tier one providers cross connect between each other. So it is totally plausible for people smaller than Clouser, that the answer will be, yeah, we see the spoof packets hitting you, but they are coming from another, another tier one. And then could you ask another tier one, even if you're not paying them directly money? I don't know. But in our case, it's much more local. Most of, of the traffic that we see are, is crossing only a single tier one. So if they were competent, if they had better uh, introspection in their network, they would be able to answer the questions, but they just cannot. But the more networks you connect directly to, the better chance that it's just coming in over your private link anyway. Absolutely. The more cross-connects we have, then the more we know. Absolutely. So yes, so the better, the, the better, inter the, the better connected parties know much, much more about how the internet works, who is actually already in traffic. And this is, this is one of the reasons why we are actually trying to cross-connect with shady entities, is to <laughs> figure out, okay, so now, it, now it's you. Thank you. I didn't notice in your uh, amplification table, but are you seeing much in the way of LDAP amplification? The, the question is about LDAP amplification. Uh, yes, there was, a, I think, I don't know, three months ago, a uh, blog post by our competition, I think by Akamai. Uh, it's about specific, it's not normal LDAP, it's a connectionless LDAP, so it's kind of a deviation on that. Yes, there were a couple of attacks on LDAP. Uh, that, uh, yeah, it's, it, they are smaller, so not, 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 as, not as interesting. But yes, we do see connectionless LDAP as well. Okay. So uh, you had a slide there that said that um, some percentage, 56%, do not allow spoofing. And can you explain how those networks do not allow spoofing? How do they manage to do that? And why are the others not able to do that? Perfect question. So the question is about the number 56.4% 56 of networks that do not allow spoofing. The answer is I have no idea. Uh, and the reason is because it's super hard to actually figure it out. So the, the particular data comes from spoofer.kaida.org project. So read on, read what, what measurements they are doing, read what methodology they are having. My understanding is that they have probes and they run probes on the internet. Uh, I think nowadays they run uh, their software on your machines. So if you install their, their piece of software, it will basically probe network and upload the data. They have, there are some privacy concerns because they don't want to reveal your IP address, so there, there's kind of a bigger subject. But basically, they do some active probing. But how, um, what specifically spoofing they are talking about? Is it spoofing within the IP ranges of this ISP or globally? I don't know, but it's there. So spoofer, spoofer.kaida.org is the data source here. Just curious, so the, the, the bandwidth attacks, the DDoSes get the big numbers in that. What, do you have any idea, like, relation? Usually the app falls first, right? If they're at, if they're okay, the, the question is about uh, what the, the, is, is the app falling first? Um, yes, in this talk we spoke specifically about layer three attacks with spoofed IP addresses, so a very specific niche of the attacks. There are tons, tons, tons of more attacks, uh, L7 attacks. Interesting tangent, for example, is DNS attacks. So we, we at Cloudflare operate DNS, uh, and DNS is connectionless, it's UDP, so we see packets which are kind of both L7 and both L3 because they are spoofed, but on the other hand, they are legitimate DNS packets. And yes, the answer is usually yes. Our DNS application will never be able to do 100 million packets per second, which we often see on DNS layers. Sorry, we used to see. Um, so yes, yeah, so for that, we are using rate limiting on IP tables layer. But again, BPFs is the main methodology. So for the connectionless stuff, for the UDP stuff, it's usually fairly easy to block and see our DNS, sorry, BPF tools. For the layer seven things on TCP, 
it's a completely different subject, and you, and you always see the proper IP address there. So you, in the, if the worst comes to, to the end, you can always block on the IP addresses. So it's way easier to mitigate. You can just blacklist the whole internet. Uh, I mean, that was actually kind of touched on my question, which was some of the stuff that was hitting um, TCP services on layer seven. Could you look for connections that were not being set up properly? And uh, just blacklist them using some sort of the, the question tool? is does the problem exist on TCP? No. If if there is a TCP connection handshake, then I know the other entity IP address. So Well you had showed a uh, a TCP dump where you were showing connections on port eighty. This, these are these are SYN packets. So SYN flats are is, is the first packet in the connection handshake. So mm -hmm. Since are fairly st st fairly normal thing, like every everyone know mm -hmm. these deal with since so it's it's basically layer three attack. So it's not a layer seven attack then. On Simplast. Sorry, but d I mean, could you do stuff to mitigate based on you know sanity checks whether or not the incoming data was representing a legitimate user versus? Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to ask? Not really, but okay. if you are asking about the details on the sim packets. And again, BPF tools. BPF tools I'm is what we use what for. I can do it in app layer. It's okay, so the app layer. So what about app layer? Higher, higher level. Okay. Um, can I ask myself a question? Uh, so the the Dyn attacks. Um, so I mentioned this talk is not about that. So from my point of view, it's not super sure what were the Dyn attacks. They were the biggest uh, published attack on the internet with 620 gigabits per second. Uh, so why 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 haven't I spent more time on that? So first is that it's not obvious what exactly was hitting uh, hitting uh, it was Krebs before dying. So it was hitting Krebs um, this this particular attack blog. Um, but from what we do know is that it was GRE packets which we with n without spoofed IP addresses. And also what we do know is that the attack had um, large post uploads. So it is possible this attack was not spoofed. Uh, so that's why I haven't mentioned it here. So yes, there, there sometimes there ha it happens that there are big attacks which are actually from legitimate IP addresses. But then I would argue it's fairly easy to block them. Thank you very much. <laughs>